falsehood, you're faced with two options. You can accept it or you can reject it. The basis upon which we take one of these actions is a product of our critical thinking capabilities and a desire to know what is true instead of confirming our bias. A lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is still putting on its shoes. On Brainstorm, we choose the hard truths over the comforting lies. Reason, compassion, skepticism, this is the Brainstorm Podcast. Hi, and welcome to the Brain, Brainstorm Podcast Skeptic Studio. Off, yeah, Off to a good start. We're out of practice here. Uh, the interview portion of the Brainstorm Podcast where we talk to a variety of folks with the intent to spread critical thinking, compassion, and skepticism. I'm Corey, and my panel tonight are Renee. Hello. Guest host, Rob. Howdy. <laughs> and the always amazing Dave. Uh, yeah, being extra amazing tonight at the table. That's right, at the table guys. and doing sound. And doing sound. <laughs> We're broadcasting live from Roman Empire Studios in Regina, Saskatchewan, and today is September 14th, 2018. Tonight's guest is Richard A. Kahn Jr., author of The Earthbound Parent, How and Why to Raise Your Little Angels Without Religion. Thanks for joining us, Richard. Thank you for having me. So I guess a good place to start would be with a little bit of your background, uh, maybe how you grew up and, and it, how religion was in a part of your life. Sure, I'll try to give a quick overview. Uh, uh, currently, I'm, I'm a managing partner of two firms. One is called Eurasia Advisors, which is a problem-solving and deal-making firm between the U.S. and Russia, primarily. I also run a group called Innovate Partners, which is a late-stage venture capital fund, uh, which has nothing to do with Russia. It's all domestic investment. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I uh, grew up in the United States, in Westchester, New York, actually in Scarsdale, and uh, uh, began the book when I got to Dartmouth. This was some some time ago, and certainly did not have a parenting angle to the book at that stage of life. <laughs> uh, but uh, I was raised, I guess you'd say Presbyterian, uh, but did not find it particularly compelling or persuasive. And had some uh, had some thoughts about it that began when I was very young, and I developed them over the course of four years. Uh, that's four zero years, while I was doing one or two other things. I lived in Russia for a long time, working with Yeltsin and his team on uh, the transition during the period when I was an equity partner with one of the big U.S. law firms. And uh, uh, through the years, uh, managed to. Uh, Finished the book, and then several publishers were kind enough to be interested, and, uh, and the book recently came out. And I'm extremely excited about it. Um, as I mentioned, I donate the royalties to a not-for-profit, uh, which is the Richard Dawkins Foundation, which focuses on uh, secular learning and science. Um, so that's a quick background, if that's helpful. Very cool. Very cool. So... Uh this book, uh, you kind of mentioned that it didn't all have to do with parenting, or is most of it about parenting? Uh, I would say that it's really written in, in – well, certainly it's in part for parents in the sense that it, it is a book that is presenting the, uh, the logic and the arguments in a manner that would be useful for parents to consider in how they raise their children. But the why aspect of the book, in other words, why do this, is uh, uh, really an argument in favor of critical thinking as opposed to uh, not utilizing critical thinking, both in, in embedding those concepts in one's child, but also in seeing that spread more throughout society. Uh, so although it seems this way, I did not write the book with the title of your program in mind, but it seems <laughs> to fit rather, rather well. So not necessarily uh, with the intent to teach people how to parent without religion, but to be people without religion in society and how that connects to parenting? 
Yeah, it, it's both. I mean, certainly the, the basic theme of the book is that I'm, I'm encouraging parents to consider as one alternative not passing along the ancient myths that they were taught, but rather to utilize critical thinking as the main framework for their children's thought process. And there's a great deal in the book both about why that's a positive thing for one, for your own child and also why that is a positive thing for society as a whole. As a whole, there's also a good deal of the book that would be quite relevant to parents who are religious in the sense that there's a fair amount, particularly in the second section of how to parent in this fashion that I think most uh, religious parents would also find extremely useful. Uh, so it's, it does cover quite a bit in a very short span of time. And that's why it took so long to write. So I've, I've got a quick question for you. Sure. Um, as a secular parent, um, I wonder, when would you suggest bringing up religion as a secular parent? Uh, what what age or maturity level would you think? I think you should talk to your children about about choosing the religion at about the same time you discuss with them whether they favor Keynesian economics or the Chicago school. Um, and <laughs> That's a great answer. So, so right away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Somewhere around two years old. But quite seriously, I mean, the, you know, religious concepts are extremely complex. You're talking about the nature of one's, well, how one views oneself in the universe. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's an extremely complex subject. Uh, so I, I think it's laughable that, you know, that people will say, well, I'll just expose them to it and let them make up their own mind. That's not actually how things work when you expose a young child to, you know, to a concept like this. And, and parents that do that, you know, seem to somehow choose their own religion as the one they expose them to. Uh, so I, 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 in all seriousness, though, I, you know, when I've raised uh, my four children, by the way, I do have four, of two generations. Some have grown, I have grandchildren, and I also have two younger ones in my second litter of kids. And uh, uh, in both cases, we, we never really expose them to religion in the sense of talking to them about this is some real thing any more than we would discuss anything else that we view as fantasy with them. Uh, but having said that, when they would raise questions, you know, because they have friends who would discuss religion, we certainly would respond to that. And the, the book deals a great deal in that area of how to raise your children in an environment where many others are religious. Right. Yeah. It's, it's an, it's an interesting because uh, so many people are are religious that uh, our kids are often inundated with all kinds of information about it, regardless of what we do, to some degree. Yeah, so, I, I agree with that. Well, you're you're right, but I, I do cover that, and the way yeah. I cover it may seem a bit unusual to you. Uh, one of the things I advocate in the section of the book that deals with how to, you know, basically how to raise kids, I encourage parents to be much more interactive with their children and to focus on their educations. You know, my kids, for example, we, we give them various languages from a very early stage and they're involved with ballet and, you know, or with piano or whatever, you know, makes sense for, for a specific child. And, uh, it's, I'm backing into something that's also quite controversial, which is we don't use cable television in our home. So the, the, the exposures that you're referring to typically do come from just turning on a TV set and allowing people, you know, to, uh, right. your children to sit in front of it. So we, we use the internet and choose much more carefully what our young children are exposed to, what movies they see, what, and what languages are watching them, uh, and those types of interactions. And the, when people sort of would say, and although many parents say they do the same thing when I tell them this, uh, you, for those that don't and, and think it odd, you might ask yourself this question. If, if a stranger came up to you in the street as you're walking with your three-year-old and said, do you mind if I say a word or two to your daughter, you might say, sure. If that same person said, do you mind if I get half an hour one-on-one -on -one just chatting with her over here on my own, you would certainly react in a different <laughs> manner. And yeah. 
But what's interesting is we don't think of it that way when we just turn on a TV. And, you know, we may feel that some of the programming is curated, meaning, say, you turn on the Disney Channel, then they're going to regulate what's put in front of your child. But the commercials may not be. And obviously, as the children develop the habit of watching TV very quickly, they're independently making those choices. And the influences on your children are certainly not in your control. And, and I, at least I would argue that for a certain number of years, you as a parent want to try to be at least thoughtful about what types of things they're exposed to and at what age, you know, they're seeing different concepts, you know, addressed. And uh, uh, so I'm not suggesting what the rules of that should be. Every parent makes their own choice. Right. But I, I think it's worthwhile to think about it rather than just letting strangers basically you know, and, and, you know, address them anytime they wish. Yeah. Something that, uh, I noticed with my own kids is that, uh, it wasn't so much TV because we didn't get cable. So the shows that they watched were shows that I wanted. I was fine letting them watch, mm-hmm. but it was YouTube. They'd often go on YouTube and they'd just, they'd be watching whoever they watched that their friends told them about for hours and hours and hours. And I actually had, very little idea of what was even being talked about on those channels. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I, th- I think, you know, one of the complex things for us as parents in this day and age is, is the access to all these different, you know, uh, resources. Uh, and much of that is good, but I think, you know, we, we do have to obviously control that. I know YouTube now has settings that you can use to, to limit, you know, what yeah. a child can see. And, you know, I don't. I can't say I like playing that role, and so I delegate that to my wife. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but you, but you, uh, but I think you have to. You know, in this day and age, what are you going to do? Let a child go on YouTube and watch anything they want at four years old? I would have loved that when I was a seven-year-old boy, but I don't. Yeah. <laughs> that would have been uh, uh, probably against the wishes of the parents. They have a kids' version of the app too, I believe. Yeah, I think that's what my son. Okay. Yeah. 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 Exactly. But. Yeah. Uh, So I'm I'm really advocating, you know, really quite active parenting and thinking about these issues and helping parents think through what they can do, what tools are available. So some of the book is extremely practical, but a lot of the the Earthbound Parent is, uh, you know, is addressing the why aspect. And so there's certainly a a significant philosophical aspect to it that I, I try to explain in a very easy to understand and very hopefully very persuasive manner. It is not a hostile book towards religious people. It's it's much more designed to persuade and, and discuss subjects. Do you is is there like a almost a counter apologetics aspect to some of it? No, I, I wouldn't think of it that way. I don't pull my punches in the book. I'm very clear about what I'm arguing and why. And uh, uh, you know, I, I'm quite clear. For example, that I I feel that. You know, the, the utilization, if you will, of the supernatural construct, that there is a, a supernatural being out there uh, that separates us, or, or I should start by saying makes us each feel very special and, and uh, give us uh, a narrative of, uh, that makes us different from other people and other groups. Uh, I do talk a lot about the negative aspects of that. And in fact, <clears throat> I'm starting to work now with the UN Anti-Terrorism Committee on utilizing the book to have this discussion take place because it really began in my mind years ago as, as a problem in sorting out how to deal with international relations when we have people utilizing the supernatural as a basis for their positions and being unable to deal with matter with issues in a more rational and you know, critical thinking manner. I'm not sure you follow what I'm saying there, but the book, the book, in other words, is, is a multi-layered text that is at once a parenting text, but also, as I said, it, it, it gets to the issues of the role of religion in society and the negative aspects of that. I, I do throw out. Okay. Hmm. Hey, um, now I, I guess I'm going to have to ask the big question for all the secular parents out there. Um, Santa Claus, what do we do? Since we're talking about skepticism, what do we do about Santa Claus? You know, it's funny you say that. Um, it's a good question. Um, what I, 
what I suggest people do with all fantasy is embrace it. And so um, I, I never for a moment would discourage a parent from letting their kids have a fantasy life and using Santa Claus or anything else uh, up to the age when they figure out that it's not true. And the only point I make is that the problem that I see with the supernatural aspects of religion is the adults didn't let that go. In other words, didn't let that fantasy go. So um, I view Santa Claus and all types of other uh, mystical figures as absolutely harmless uh, as long as you don't tell your child when they come to you at seven or eight years old, honey, Santa Claus controls the universe and you bet he's real. You know, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's not the right response. You, know, you, <laughs> right. you, you gradually let your child, you know, grow into a, a, a more reality based existence, even if they continue to want to play fantasy games once in a while. So, uh, you know, again, it's, it's only the aspect of the supernatural deities and, and all the elements that, 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 that flow from that in terms of how people conceive of themselves, how children see themselves as being watched all the time and punished and all these different things. That's the construct that I'm discussing that's not helpful, not, not fantasy life. So to the extent you view religion as fantasy, as I do, you could make an argument that you can let that take place for a while. Uh, the only problem that I note in the book is because society is so is, is so filled with people that do not view that as fantasy. I don't recommend that you utilize a deity as a fantasy because it's a little harder than to uh, disengage from that as a child living in a in a religious society. Does that help? Yeah, uh, that helped quite a bit. So yeah. I, I'm I'm curious about um, I, I'm wondering what you think about this. With um, is the aversion to like fantasy as a child? Does it have any correlation to, um, I guess, not being as skeptical as an adult? And I guess what I mean by that is, like, 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 just to give you an example, uh, I won't say who, but somebody I know was very religious, or was sorry when they were growing up, and I find that now as an adult they. They have um, a lot of aversions to like natural health remedies or like woo, like 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 you know non science based uh, medicine things like that, and they're constantly falling for all these things, right? And constantly buying into them. Have you found at all? Like I know Santa Claus is maybe not as extreme as say Christianity and things like that in terms of the kind of fantasy it is, but have you found there's any direct connection to that as an adult? Is it is in like how you will perceive uh, people's information? based on your childhood experience? Yeah, the way I approach it in the book, it, it, it pertains to integrity, ethics, and such. The, the way I would express it is that if you train a child to suspend rational thought and critical thinking on the most, one, arguably the most important element of life, which is why we're here, who we are, what our identity is, and you basically say to them, look, you need to learn not to think about that. Just don't think. You know, here's the answer. You know, people in robes, you know, you know, they wear these nice white robes or black robes. They know the answer. <laughs> nice hats. They say, they say the same things I do. So stop thinking. I, I do, I guess the way I would put it is I do not think it's coincidental that people who are, <clears throat> who have been trained to be highly religious in the sense of believing in the supernatural. <clears throat> and I am making that distinction. I'll come back to in a few minutes, I'm sure. Uh, I, I think it's it's not unusual for them to be more credulous during their lives. And that's really what I think you're asking. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah because they're used to suspending their uh, their critical thought process. It doesn't mean that they're not super intelligent. No, definitely but not. They, but they've, tra they've trained themselves in a specific way to say, well, there are areas we don't think about. And um, I don't think that's a healthy thing for children. Uh, no. <laughs> and so that's why I, part of the reason why I wrote the book. Yeah, no, that's, uh, I think, I think it's a fair to say, like a fair statement to say that, yeah, if you train people to shut off their critical thinking, then they will continue to not think critically. Yeah. Yeah. I always hear these two terms tossed around in Catholic faith, uh, faith and reason. 
Faith and reason. So <laughs> that they're compatible with each other. Right. So, so. <laughs> that, I suppose there are, I mean, there is an entire field of philosophy that's like uh, religious philosophy. Yeah, for sure. Like and, theologies like that. And yeah. they're trying to I, I examine their religious faith through this critical thinking lens. Yeah. Which is where you get a lot of those weird uh, philosophical arguments oh, for... Some of those texts are daunting. They're yeah. just daunting. Yeah. The theology of the body is really interesting, but it's like incredibly daunting to get through. Yeah. yeah. I mean, fundamentally, it's, it's not it's not rocket science to realize that when people talk about faith, that's a code word for saying, you know, don't think about it. <laughs> yeah. So, right. Just trust. That's what it is. Yeah, just trust. And, um, and look, a lot of the book also deal and it's, it's a short book it's only 150 pages but the it's i'd say the meat of the book is the psychology section of what it is that drives us all or attracts us all towards the supernatural towards wanting to believe this which which is the, the credulous factor uh, because and, and that's the element of the book that's really saying that we're all in this together we just may resolve the problem differently but we all fear for example death we all desire immortality we all want to belong. We, you know, all these different types of, of desires and fears that we're filled with, um, and it's uh, it's quite natural that we gravitate towards an answer that uh, that solves those problems for us. And some people, you know, are able to sort of turn off their critical thinking side because they've been raised that way, uh, and to be able to answer all those questions by just mouthing a word like God, you know, whatever that means, you know. It, it's a uh, it's a remarkable thing, actually. I, I find it interesting that people can be satisfied with with really no answer ultimately, but uh, or nothing that moves them any closer to an answer just by you know forming a word in their mouths. Uh, but that's that's how it seems to work in much of the world, and it's, it's because it's for historic reasons because we did all begin long ago, our you know our societies with without scientific knowledge, without Darwinism. In other words, without explanations for many things, and so it's natural that we we came up with a, with an answer or a series of answers that uh, somehow satisfied it. And obviously, the supernatural is at the heart of that. And it's hard to kick that. And that's again why I wrote the book to try to pull it apart and make it easier to see all these different strains and and help people sort of decide to cut it off at the past by not you know sharing this with the next generation. So I guess a, a slightly different vein uh, is like, how how do you think that, uh, or rather, what do you think of the current state of secularism or uh, this religious faith playing into the way society is run right now? In, in which country do you mean? Worldwide? Well, let's say in particular your country <laughs> in the U.S. there. Gee, we had to pick a really nice starting <laughs> point. <laughs> well, well, look, you know, we, I, I, I don't know if I'm in the minority, but certainly uh, I've written the book to provide some cover so other people can also speak about it. Uh, you know, I, I don't think the atheist or agnostic community is, is particularly well, you know, well perceived in the United States. The, uh, there still is this ancient holdover uh, that if you're identified with a religious group, that's a stamp of approval. It means it means that you're good, and and if you're not part of that, that you're not. And and that uh, that sort of ethical undercurrent, I think, runs very strong, particularly in the red states of the United States. Um, I don't as I and I sort of show this in the book, I, I don't think there's any correlation whatsoever between someone believing in a supernatural entity and their ethical frame, framework being higher than someone else's. In fact, I think I show on the book, uh, it's quite the contrary that, yeah. you know, simply checking a box that you belong to a group, uh, can be an end run around thinking about ethics. And if you really start thinking about ethics, that's when you begin to have an ethical framework. So, uh, and I can, you know, demonstrate this off the top of my head. You, you see all the steps that have been taken by our current administration, whether it's against children or immigrants or the poor. You know, these certainly are not the ethical values that these purported religious 
you know, groups, uh, you know, uh, or I should say that they purport to hold near and dear. So um, um, it's a long battle that we're engaged in now, but I'm very confident that over time, you know, that uh, even those who are highly religious will at least come to the, reach the conclusion that, uh, that that is not uh, a, a label that, that means that others who do not share their views are not equally ethical or equally good people. And once that happens, that, that's going to be, I think, the starting point of the, uh, I guess you would say, the disintegration of sort of the branding of religion as the, uh, as the hallmark of a good person. And uh, I think that's a big part of what they offer. And then also, we've only had 160 years of uh, Darwinism. So we've only had a, a short period of time during which we as, as, a, uh, as humans have had an understanding of, of how we came about. That's a rational alternative to the supernatural. And so I, I also think it takes some time for that to permeate uh, societies, including in the U.S. Um, so it, it's... You know, it's a long road, um, but it's it's one I think we'll get down, uh, Corey. And it's uh, it, and obviously I'm spending my free time going around talking about this, and including the book, to uh, to try to make a little headway in that regard because I, I think it benefits society overall to eliminate these uh, what I view as false bases for us to dislike one another and to think of ourselves as better than another group. Yeah, I, I can't disagree. <laughs> the uh, do you think that uh, there? Do you put much stock in the idea that uh, atheism or uh, secular beliefs are on the rise? I I, I wouldn't want to guess. I, I don't really have a. Uh, I haven't studied that personally, and so I've been, I, I've heard arguments on both sides from people that were. That the world's going in the wrong direction. Others, you know, look at you, look at the <laughs> Northern Europeans, who obviously are extremely secular. Uh, the blue states seem to be, I guess, arguably more secular as a general rule. But I, I don't. I wouldn't want to. Uh, I, I just don't have the statistics. I haven't looked at it, but I, I, I'm sure somebody's trying to figure that out. Canada's a growing secular nation, as far as I understand. Yeah, uh, like less and less of people identify as religious. I guess I right. would say, yeah, yeah. I don't, and, and I don't it's, looking be, it's looking better and better to me over the last couple of years. <laughs> hey, we, got, we have <laughs> so much enough. space here. We have so much space. <laughs> yeah, lots of open space. <laughs> Sounds good. Lots of water too. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> until, until you folks take that too. So, <laughs> yeah. Don't. By, by the way, I might interject. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to interject. That, you know, one thing I did want to mention very briefly is that you you may have noticed I, I'm trying to distinguish between you know, if you will, the religious culture and the belief in the supernatural. And what I'm really saying to parents is there is a way, and it's not hard, to remain part of your culture. Say you're Jewish or Episcopalian and you're, you have family ties and all this. There, there certainly are plenty of ways to remain identified with your tribe in that sense without embracing in the next generation the supernatural. And Hmm. The, the book deals at, at some length with that. And although I'm not necessarily a fan of any tribalism, it certainly is, in my view, far less harmful both to a child and to society simply to say, look, we're all from, you know, this tribe of Israel. You know, this is where we come from geographically. This is our, our background. These are the foods we eat. These are some of our traditions. That's a very different thing than saying, oh, and by the way, you know, you are – the son of uh, or daughter of God, and this is what God is, and um, and the, and these people they don't they don't worship the same God, and we've been fighting them forever, and they're trying to take our you know you know take things from us. It's it, it is an important distinction, and I just want to be sure to mention that. Yeah, I I find myself often uh, conflicted because so many. Uh, cultural practices revolve around what people consider as the sacred or the, the spiritual. And, uh, as a, a person who doesn't believe in that, I, I, I want to respect their cultures without, you know, being like, yeah, spirits. <laughs> <laughs> I know how you feel. 
<laughs> yeah, especially here in Saskatchewan, because right. the First Nations people specifically, I'm thinking, yeah, like, like there's a big need for them to be um, legitimized, right, and to be able to express their culture exactly. in various ways, in in, in public ways, yeah. and, and be included. And but yet, ultimately, when somebody tells me, "Oh, well, my cancer was cured at this sweat," I'm not like, "Oh yeah, I bet it was." Yeah, like, like no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, look, I can I can comment briefly on it because. We are in a transitional period, at least I'm hoping it's a, tra- it's a transitional period. The last maybe a few hundred more years as we move away from these, these godlike concepts that people have uh, and more into just the cultural stuff that you're talking about. Uh, but, you know, the way I would suggest thinking of it, and I, I don't mean to make light of it, but it, it at least makes it clear how, how I would think of it. You know, if someone comes up to you and says, you know, we're part of, in our city, we're, we're part of a sect that believes in the, you know, in the magic bunny rabbit on the other, it's purple, it's on the other side of the universe, and it's very good, and, you know, it it controls things, and, and it's created everything, and we we worship the bunny rabbit, and we we go to church to do that, and, and we have various bunny rituals that we engage in. You know, if my kids and I were discussing it, I might say that, look, okay, there are people who believe this. I, I think when they're engaged in their activities, you don't have to make a big deal of it. You know, you can, if you want to dance around a bunny rabbit tree or whatever, you can do that. Uh, But that doesn't mean you need to agree with or respect the, the core belief that the bunny rabbit is the, you know, is controlling the universe. And, uh, and so I try to take it lighter in that sense. In other words, I, I, it's not a question of of disrespecting people. It's just sort of looking at their views and sort of saying, "Well, you're entitled to think whatever you want and uh, and to live your lives accordingly." And I can maybe sing some songs with you if the bunny rabbit songs are melodic. And uh, but if they ever sit down and have a conversation with me and say, "Hey, what do you think about the bunny rabbit?" I would probably say, guys, that's sort of delusional since you're asking me directly. <laughs> I would try to be more polite at first, but if they really push, that's where I would come out. And, uh, you know, so, uh, I, so I don't think it has to be brought to a head is my point. I think the vast majority of cases you can, you know, participate in society without making a big deal of it, you know. Or another way to put it is, you know, every, everybody you know, who's religious – has no trouble rejecting religion on a daily basis. All they need to do is add one more, meaning they, they reject every other religion on the planet as nonsense, mm-hmm. right, except for their own. And so those of us who are agnostic or, I guess, more probably practically speaking, atheistic um, and secular, we've just added one more religion to the list. The only thing I'm I, the only thing I would, I would kind of wonder a bit is uh, I, I guess I'm a little cynical with this <laughs> this um, it, it invades public policy too often. I think that's my problem. Um, some of people's belief systems, right? Like, yeah. um, and, you bet. And, and, and yeah, and so you know, at that point, it's like we actually do need to kind of confront it in some some respects. And and yes, we do. Yes, we do. And that's you know, look, I, I do view religion or religious organizations. For reasons I get into in detail, it is essentially anti-democratic. I mean, a lot of you know, yeah. look at what religions are, the hierarchical structures, the command aspects of it, the non-questioning aspects of it. You know, it, it is essentially uh, comes from dictatorial times. You know, uh, imperial times. Um, and yes, it's very frightening to see it linked in with government. You know, in my country, the United States, uh, it's not supposed to be that way. <laughs> we have specific language in the Constitution to stop it, and the people who came over and wrote the Constitution did not want religion to be part of our government at all. Um, you know, the religious, you know, certainly the, the Christian part of the United States always says we're a Christian nation. That's that's simply not the case, if you look at the history. Um, and by the way, there were some people here called Indians before we got here, and <laughs> so I have no idea how, how they come to that conclusion, but Certainly the early settlers had various religious beliefs, but, you know, at the, at the heart of it, they wanted to found a nation that did not have the same problems we had back in Europe, uh, where religion 
uh, was deeply involved in government and created all types of problems. And we're seeing some of that play out now in the U.S., where we have this flavor that, uh, 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 that again, that it's only the religious people who have an ethical framework of any value. And it's become viewed as normal for religious organizations, which, by the way, are uh, tax-free entities in the U.S. to be able to participate in our politics. Uh, so it does have to be fought against, and that's another reason why I'm spending my pro bono time doing this. It's not. It's not right. <laughs> something. Something that I think. Uh, I. I mean, maybe I'm drawing correlations where they don't really exist, but that I think I've noticed is that a lot of countries that didn't explicitly reject religion the way the U.S. did ended up currently in the modern age more secular where the u.s uh tended to like they put in their uh constitution at the start of the founding of the country the the separation of church and state very much and uh but now ever it's almost like ever since then the the religious people in the u.s have been pushing back on that and trying to impose more and more theocracy uh, uh, what do you think of that kind of idea? Like, do you think that secularism is just something that, if it had been left alone, the U.S. would have evolved into? Um, you know, there's there's no way to, to to know. But just speculating, I would say no. You know, when I look at, you know, for example, Latin America, or you know, Central South America, and even going into North America and Mexico, you know, if you have strong <clears throat> religious traditions, and that, in those cases, largely Catholic. Uh, I think it's extremely difficult to get rid of that uh, from um, from society and the intertwining of government. You look throughout the Middle East, you see basically a, you know different religions there, you know, controlling. You see the impact of it in um, certainly in much of Asia, uh, even in Russia, it's coming back now strongly. Although I think that's more of a business decision, you know, the linkage of the Catholic Church. Excuse me, the uh, you know uh, the uh, uh, the Church of Russia to uh, uh, to the government, um, but it, you know we have to, I guess, keep in mind that you know while there are people who are truly religious, uh, meaning believing in God, uh, the history of the world is also one made up of people who are in power, utilizing the authority in, 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 that they receive by uh, ostensibly being tied to the supernatural God um, to control things in their in their own domain. So they use it as a source of power uh, to run their countries and to, um, you know, control their populations. Uh, and it's very difficult um, to draw lines in terms of where, where, where it's genuine religious fervor and where it's just being utilized, you know, as, as, a, as a, an extra sort of a, a force for, uh, uh, you know, authority on steroids, essentially, by utilizing the, uh, the supernatural. So I, I do think because of the history that religion began, and for the reasons I think are really quite clear, which I stated already from a period where we didn't have any knowledge of things and we just came up with explanations, I think it's really hard to get it out of our system because it does such a good job of making people feel comfortable about a variety of issues that they don't want to think about. Uh, although I think there are easy answers to some of these things that people just haven't gotten back to them, including you know, what do you say at night to your child when they're afraid of dying? You know, a lot of people will say, well, we tell them about heaven and all this other stuff. And I propose an answer that's, you know, far easier. I think it's only 12 words and my kids never brought it up again. So I, I, it's a long way of saying I, I don't think that this stuff gets out of our system easily. And uh, it's part of why I and many others are sort of fighting to get the issue raised so that we uh, we at least have some strategy for, you know, sending up a signal that it's it's not necessary to have a belief in a deity in order to be a good person and to raise your children to be, you know, wonderful people, ethical people who are doing wonderful things in the world um, without believing themselves better than somebody else because they're tied to some supernatural entity. I'd be curious to know what that 12 word answer was you were talking about. For <laughs> to tell your kid if when they ask about death, we'll give it away right now. 
you just you just smile at them and say, "It'll be just the way it was before you were born." Ah, that's interesting. And you know, I thought I believed that I thought of this, and then I found out I was disappointed that a, a <laughs> Scottish philosopher named David Hume came up with the same answer in the 1700s. But, <laughs> yeah. but, but back in those days, it was much more dangerous to write about this stuff. Yeah, I, well, I wouldn't be too disappointed in thinking like David Hume uh, on that one occasion. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I've always kind of connected it to uh, – there, there's a film called The Fountain um, by Darren Aronofsky, and it's like a very multi-religious film. And I always find his films really interesting for that reason. But but he kind of connected the idea of like being – going back into the earth in some way, right? Like being planted into a tree was kind of his whole vision in that film. And that almost reminds me of what you're saying. Like it's like, yeah, like you, wow. de- you decompose, you become part of – Right. Um, like, yeah, like it just all goes back to the way it was. Like there's no – it's not. It's not an afterlife. It's not. It's not. It's. It's ma- not really spiritual per se, but it is profound. I guess maybe that's a good way of looking at it. That's in part why I picked the title "The Earthbound Parent." But yeah, fun, the basic point, which some might say has Buddhist, you know, uh, elements to it, is that yeah, I am saying that the narrative that I think is more positive for a child is that it's just us, you know, and that we all have to get along. That we need to solve our own problems. That. You know, we're more advanced animals than some, but but this is it. And it, it is that time limitation, the mortality, that I think focuses our attention or can focus our attention on doing positive things in the world during oh, the yeah. short period that we have here. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I, you know, the message of the book, believe me, is a very positive one. It's, it's not beating up on the supernatural, quite the contrary. It's saying, you know, there are alternatives that are, frankly, far better and make more sense and are more consistent both ethically and from a perspective of integrity with, uh, you know, with what you want to tell your child. In other words, I use the word integrity because I, I've always found it um, a shame that parents essentially pass along a myth to their children that is a foundation of some part of, of portions of our society, which really is pretty obviously not true. And so children grow up sort of sitting there thinking, okay, what is this? You know, it, it, it's this suspension of reality. I mean, I'll, it's, sure, some people buy it hook, line, and sinker, but for many others, it just creates a very weak foundation for an ethical framework. And I don't think it's necessary. And that's what I lay out in the book is what the, what you substitute for that if you don't if you don't uh, uh, utilize, if you will, uh, a, a religious structure uh, to provide uh, ethical training and. It's always amusing to me when people ask me, you know, well, where do your kids get ethics from if not from from church or from temple? And uh, if you want, I'll answer it, but uh, you guys probably can answer it yourselves. I get mine from movies. I'm only half true on that. Well, but. well most of us get them from fortune cookies. But, uh, <laughs> but the... Uh, I mean, the real answer, if you ask somebody, and if they, if they have two seconds to think, they'll say, I got my, my morals, my ethics from my parents. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Your yeah definitely. And every, everybody would answer that if they're answering truthful, truthfully. And it, so it's remarkable to me. I mean, and then you can get into the argument, okay, well, and my parents got them from there, or is going back, but where did they come from a billion years ago? And so then you get into, yeah, yeah that's, that's a whole different type of discussion. Uh, but the point is, you know, once you start thinking about this stuff, it's really, you know, at least I, I hope I presented it in the way of the book, it's really not that difficult. It takes some time to pull it apart and think it all through. Um, but I'd at least like to think that anybody reading The Earthbound Parent, would, whether they're religious or not, would at least come away with some substantial doubts about the wisdom of passing along these sorts of myths to their children and to and, and the wisdom of at least considering the alternatives of doing that. And then, of course, getting into the other sections of the book that just are more general about how how we can parent better in a society where there are all these distractions um, and, and where we, you know, to try to help our children become engaged in the real world rather than the virtual world. Oh, definitely, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's and, a, an actual, like... Uh... I don't know, ongoing tr- uh, struggle to, like lately. Yeah, I mean, we talked offline, you know, about chess for a bit before getting into it. I mean, chess is yes. one of many, many things I recommend 
that parents consider teaching their kids, you know? Um, and, uh, there are reasons that I mentioned why that's, you know, one of my, you know, favorite things to bring up, but you know, there are hundreds of ideas I give in the book essentially of what, what people can do in real life rather than just turning on their TV or letting their kids play on their iPhones. Uh, but chess, you know, is, is one that is inexpensive and, and helps children develop confidence, critical thinking skills, decision making, all, all types of things flow from that. And, uh, um, and as I mentioned, well, you know, I, I do a lot of work in the chess world, but one of the things I do is I'm on a, a, a board of a not for profit where we have taught chess now to 1.3 million second and third graders in the U.S. school system, public schools. And we want to do a lot, lot more of that. And, uh, you know, it changes the dynamic of a school to have kids competing, having fun, playing chess with one another rather than video games or whatever they you know, choose to do. Um, again, it's not it's not a total answer, but parents have surprisingly great power in shaping their children in the early years. And it's always interesting to me that more parents don't make use of that. And, and, and instead of just deferring to how society sort of suggests it should be done. Yeah. And I, I also have friends who are the opposite where they make too much use of that and indoctrinate <laughs> them into things yeah. <laughs> that are probably not healthy well, for sure. them. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, obviously <clears throat> I've written the book to try to persuade them not to go down one particular road, but yeah. ultimately, yeah. you know, every parent has the right to make their own decisions. And I respect that. I'm, for but sure. that doesn't mean I, I can't at least try to give them some ideas of, of what might work and uh, mm-hmm. um, and what the alternative one alternative might be to in a situation where there may seem not to be an alternative. Although there is, is there is a limit to the, their rights in, in our country at least with child protection laws. There, there's a limit to what they can teach their kids. Uh, well, I'm interested happy in to hear that. Depending on on what the laws are. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <yeah. laughs> uh, but yeah, I think yeah, my own bias would be I, I think you know one wants to be very careful about limiting a parent's discretion. Yeah, for sure. But but of course, society always look. We, we're one of the beautiful things about non-religious society is that it does advance over time. Meaning, it's not tied to any specific text. It goes back a you know a thousand years, supposedly to a time where everybody knew more than we do now. Even though in every other discipline we would all laugh at the idea that, yeah, they knew more about medicine back in those days than we do. Right. But somehow in terms of theology and these things, they somehow were, you know, were perfect. Um, but the world does advance and society advances. And certainly, you know, if a society reaches a conclusion that there's a minimum standard for care of a child, both physically and, and psychologically, you know, I, I think that that's normal. We certainly have plenty of rules in virtually every society against, you know, physical abuse of children. And exactly. I can certainly yeah. see how a society could say, well, there are certain things you just can't teach a child, uh, you know, because that's harmful to their psyche. Yeah. I'm not advocating that for religion, by the way. I'm, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> going anywhere near that far. No. Although I do argue that it's, it is damaging to kids to have the construct, but I don't suggest that parents shouldn't have the ability to make those choices, of course, for themselves. Yeah, that would have to be a very, like, nuanced discussion. Very for, nuanced. <laughs> like, very nuanced. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's why I wrote the book in a very, well, you, if you read it, you'll see what I mean, in a way to try to take it easy and, and be friendly about the topic, and, but also making clear that it really is not a very good choice for children and explaining why that is. Uh, but... You know, it's it's probably you know, look. I realize that the vast majority of highly religious people are never going to read the book. They they would not want to consider it. But those that are borderline, you know, oh, yeah. hopefully it'll have an impact on them. And more and more people are in that position. There certainly are plenty of parents I know who were raised with religion and didn't really want to pass it along, and found this was a helpful way of thinking through the issues. Um, it you know, it just frankly covers virtually anything you could you could think of. In terms of uh, both why and how to do it, uh, but um, um, mm-hmm. yeah, but people obviously at the end of it make make their own choice. 
Well, I think that's a really interesting demographic you're, you're pointing out, though, the people on the edge kind of thing or, or questioning or, you know, not sure. I, like, I, I definitely have a friend who, um, that was one thing she said to me. She has some kids and she's been a part of, like, a Christian church for a long time and kind of right. saying, like, if I leave that church, you know, where where do I get my, my community from? You know, do the kids right. do the kids learn good things? You know, on and on and on, that kind of stuff, right? So, so that's definitely a huge concern for some of these parents who are on the fringe kind of considering... Right. What do I do? You know. Well, yeah, that's exactly right. And so I, I did cover some of it's in the Q and A at the back of the book, but I, I try to deal with with a variety of situations that people can be faced with. You, you describe one, which you know, where someone gets a lot of value from the community. That's a very common scenario. I mean, for many religions, the religion is really a business, right? You know. Oh uh, yeah. You're, you're tied into a community, and they trade with one another, or they hire one another, all sorts of things. And so there are many practical reasons why you would want to be in that, or, or may, you may be dependent on them for money or for food, right? So there are, or, or you may be in a, you know, you'd be raised in Turkey where, you know, you hear the loudspeaker go off five times a day. Let me tell you, when I was there and heard that, I thought, wow, it's really hard, hard not to come out as a fairly religious person when that happens to you all day long, every day. That's wild. So, each situation is different, but I, I would say that, you know, that there are certainly ways, which I describe in the book, you know, to be part of these societies and these organizations and these communities without the literal uh, supernatural aspect being passed along to your children without believing that. In other words, you can, you know, certainly, you know, have discussions with your child about uh, the, the ethical benefits, basically saying, look, you know, I share the, you know, the idea that we should be good to one another. Uh, and the people in this organization certainly subscribe to that. But that doesn't mean that you have to go full bore into the supernatural. And that's where I would suggest parents consider drawing the line. Uh, for those who are in slightly different communities, there certainly are plenty of uh, community activities that are secular that people can get involved with. And I think more and more of those are developing, you know, within some of the, you know, larger cities and stuff. I mean, there are countless examples I give in the book of organizations, groups, of athletics, you know, uh, clubs of all sorts. Uh, but I, I think the basic thing we want to remember, though, is that in our societies, whether in Canada or the United States and in the vast majority of societies in the world, we're no longer in a position where the ethical framework comes from religion. We have this thing called rule of law. And for every one of the Ten Commandments, let's assume maybe four of them still have some relevance, and you know if you read them, uh, there are uh, you know a hundred thousand laws that exist. Uh, meaning, we we have through the advancement of civilization, we we have put in writing the ethical framework that we want to have, and it's no surprise that we have come a long, long way since you know. Well, you know, uh, since whatever BC or whenever you want to date different documents that one religion or another decides to rely upon. And I view that as an extraordinarily good thing that, you know, it's not enough just to say, you know, uh, do unto others, you know, whatever. And we now have a thousand scenarios of exactly how we want to treat one another, including minorities, including women, including this and that. And those represent, in my mind, great advances, just as we've had advances in science and in medicine. And they're reflected in our ethical codes, which are our laws. Um, and so I think if people, you know, read this and start to get, and, and, you know, if they start to get the idea that, you know, these organizations really don't provide a necessary function, other than the fact that, as you say, they are holdovers, of, you know, of communities. And some people want to be part of those. I can understand that, that people like to sit together and sing songs and have a feeling of, of belonging together. That's one of the main psychological dimensions that draws us towards religion. Um, but, you know, you don't have to get your belonging sense that way. There are alternatives if you decide to look at them. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, again, just a question of what specific circumstance a certain person finds himself or herself in. Hmm. 
Well, I think uh, we're coming up close to the hour. Uh, so is there anywhere where people can find uh, more information on you or the book or uh, anything else that you might like to share? Sure. Well, thanks for that opportunity. You know, first, the, the book itself, uh, as you know, is entitled The Earthbound Parent, How and Why to Raise Your Little Angels Without Religion. And that's, you know, something you can, if you can't get it in your bookstore, you can ask for it there, or it's, of course, online uh, on Amazon, and it's with a real publisher and the whole bit. And uh, uh, in terms of my bio, probably the easiest way to get that is to go to uh, the website of, of uh, Eurasia Advisors, uh, which is, uh, well, it's spelled as it would sound, Eurasia Advisors, with the A in the middle shared between Eurasia and Advisors. Dot com And that contains both uh, biographical info on, on me and my team and also on uh, uh, the press section, you know, covers the work that I did in Russia, the, the keynote I gave to the United Nations on a related subject of international law and a variety of other pieces of information. Um, the, uh, beyond that, uh, you can Google me in the chess world. Uh, and if people are interested in chess, as I think I mentioned to you, I, I represent in a variety of ways the current world champion. And uh, so I'm a big fan of people using their minds uh, to solve problems. Um, but those would be the easiest ways to you know, learn more about uh, me, if that's of interest. But what I really hope is people will look at the book. It, it's As I said, it's not because I make money from it. I don't. But because I, I really did put a lot of thought into it. So it, I, I think it's a useful tool, uh, both for parents or for grandparents to give to their, you know, to their kids, um, as well as for people who are just reading it to understand sort of the societal issues uh, that come up if we remain uh, tethered to this uh, rather ancient and, in my view, harmful set of myths. I think this is an incredible, uh, incredibly important book. No, I, uh, you, you've convinced me. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm going to go take a peek well, at it. Yeah. Well, I, I'd, uh, I hope you do. Yeah. I will, uh, buy a copy for a listener, the first listener who, uh, contacts me who wants a copy of the book. I'm going to email you right now. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Well, guys. Well, first, I'm grateful for you uh, in having me on. Obviously, I'm doing you know, I'm doing book tour stuff now. So, if people are interested. There'll be a book signing at, at Shakespeare and Co. That's in December 6th in New York. Uh, I'll be at Books and Books down in Miami in uh, uh, November 6th, and then uh, I'll be doing something in Moscow. I'll be doing something in Kiev in conjunction with some other travel. Um, but in any event, yeah, you can follow us also, I should have mentioned, on um, the uh, people, I hope you, that people will join us on the Facebook page for the book, which is entitled The Earthbound Parent. I do now have a Twitter account, which is Richard Kahn Jr. at C-O-N-N-J-R. And I'm gradually getting into the mode of posting, and I'll do more of it, trust me, as, uh, as I get warmed up to that whole idea. M- most of my life has been quite private and discretionary, or I should say discreet, in the work I do. But this is a public venture, and so I'm going to, uh, you know, certainly wade in, you know, both on the politics of, uh, of religion and the, uh, and the impact it has on society. Cool. If you ever come around, uh, you, ever, you ever find yourself around the prairies somewhere, you, you let us know, too. Yeah, for sure. I'll do that, guys, uh, for sure. And also, uh, you have an open invitation for lunch in New York if you venture oh. down here. I will uh, probably never make it to New York. I, I might. I, I, will, I will try someday. I, I might. So we'll see. <laughs> it's a, it's a thing that has been on my well, uh, you, bucket list, I guess you could say. I'm a big well, Knicks I, fan. I, so. As I said, I have been up in Canada several times, so I'm hoping to have reason to get back up there. And uh, beautiful country. And and as I said, like if. if uh, <laughs> if things keep going the way they are in the U.S. with uh, with, uh, <laughs> yeah. with, with Trump and his guys, I, I may spend more time up there. Well, we'll take you as an asylum seeker. Yeah, that's yeah, right. I, pre- I, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, Richard, for coming on the show. Um, I guess this is where we'll close the Skeptic Studio, and we're going to go to a break. Very good. Thanks, gentlemen. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> 
If you like what we're doing and want to help us keep the lights on, go become a patron at patreon.com forward slash brainstorm podcast. You can hear the bonus half hour that we record every episode and get a shout out when you support the show. Become a patron for just a dollar an episode at patreon.com forward slash brainstorm podcast. Or you can support the show by ordering a t-shirt, mug or other gear from our store at cafepress.ca forward slash brainstorm podcast gear. If you can't afford to become a patron or buy gear, then why not give us a rating or write a review on iTunes or Stitcher? Every rating makes it easier for people to find us. Thanks for your support. Tired of living in a culture of lies, fake news, and alternative facts? The Pro-Truth Pledge reverses the tide of lies by calling on politicians and everyone else to commit to truth-oriented behaviors. Take the pledge at ProTruthPledge.org. The Atheists, The Bible, and No Wardrobe, the podcast. Wait a minute. No wardrobe? You mean we're going to be naked while we do this? Well, seeing how I'm an atheist and I'm reading the Bible, and since clothes are flammable... Fire! 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 I thought it might be a good idea to take them all off first. (laughs) Naked or not... Follow along as we read, analyze, and try to keep you from falling asleep as we go through this boring-ass book. Find us on iTunes, Stitcher, and Spreaker. Who knows? We may even be on YouTube someday. So I'm going to do a reading from the book White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo. It's uh, it's kind of a short reading. Uh, I just feel triggered. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Not me. I'm brown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it, the reading is from the very first chapter, not the introduction, not the author thing before the first chapter. The first chapter. She starts off. I am a white woman. I am standing beside a black woman. We are facing a group of white people who are seated in front of us. We are in their workplace and we have been hired by their employee to lead them in a dialogue about race. The room is filled with tension and charged with hostility. I have just presented a definition of racism that includes the acknowledgement that whites hold social and institutional power over people of color. A white man is pounding his fist on the table. His face is red and he is furious. As he pounds, he yells, a white person can't get a job anymore. I look around the room and see 40 employees, 38 of whom are white. Why is this white man so angry? Why is he being so careless about the impact of his anger? Why are all the other white people either sitting in silent agreement with him or tuning out? We have, after all, only articulated a definition of racism. White people in North America live in a society that is deeply separate and unequal by race, and white people are the beneficiaries of that separation and inequality. As a result, we are insulated from racial stress. At the same time that we have come to feel entitled and to and deserving of our advantage, given how seldom we experience racial discomfort in a society we dominate, we haven't had to build a racial stamina, socialized into a deeply internalized sense of superiority that we either are unaware of or not or can never admit to ourselves. We have become, we become highly fragile in conversations about race. We consider a challenge to our racial worldviews as a challenge to our very identities as good moral people. Thus, we perceive any attempt to connect us to the system of racism as an unsettling and unfair moral offense. The smallest amount of racial stress is intolerable. The mere suggestion that being white has meaning often triggers a range of defensive responses. These include emotions such as anger, fear, and guilt, and behaviors such as argumentation, silence, and withdrawal from the stress-inducing situation. These responses work to reinstate white white equilibrium as they repel the challenge, return our racial comfort, and maintain our dominance within the racial hierarchy. I conceptualize this process as white fragility, Though white fragility is triggered by discomfort and anxiety, it is born of superiority and entitlement. White fragility is not weakness per se. 
In fact, it is a powerful means of white racial control and the protection of white advantage. Summarizing the, the familiar patterns of white people's responses to racial discomfort as white fragility has, re res has resonated for many people. The sensibility is so familiar because whereas our personal narratives vary, we are all swimming in the same racial water. So that's that. I, uh, I didn't want to get too deep into the, sure. the book because I, th I really do think that er everybody should read or listen to that book. It's pretty, pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. The idea that <laughs> we're white people because we haven't had to be white. We're just the default for so long. We just – we're really fragile when we're told that we're white or we're told that <laughs> we're, we aren't superior or that we take part in systems that oppress people. It's racism, Corey. Yeah. <laughs> That's re <laughs> reverse yeah, racism. Uh, being racist. It's reverse racism. Yeah, uh, that one pisses me off. Um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a video floating around Facebook uh, about white fragility and it's kind of funny. That's about uh, I think it's probably not, maybe it's around Twitter, but there's there's one of those. It's like college humor or something. I don't remember who made oh, it, but okay, uh, maybe I have seen can, that one. Yeah, she goes to touch the black woman's hair, and the black woman was like, "No, you can't touch my hair." And she's like, "Oh, my sensibilities." So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's. That's pretty. That one's pretty funny, and it, and it hits straight on with what this this chapter was about. How we as white people have do have trouble facing uh, when we are called uh, called out on our unintentional racism is what it is. Right. A lot of times, um, yeah. and we all all I think all white people do it. it it's a given. We, we grow up in a society where we we actually don't have to think about that most of the time and sometimes it's like oh crap i can't believe i just said that right you know yeah i uh <laughs> i'm i'm currently listening to uh so you want to take talk about race by Ijeomo Aulu i think that's right hmm. uh, and it's it's similar to, it's about kind of it talks about a lot about that same kind of idea like where uh, white people tend to just say things and just do things and uh, without thinking about it, and and it often contributes to like uh, si uh, stereotypes and oppression in ways that we don't really recognize, and 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 then we get defensive when it's brought up to our attention. So, right, it, it's sort of like this weird form of passive racism that we have. Yeah. When yeah, we, it's not intentional racism like some bigoted asshole in the south somewhere, right? It's it's the guy in in <laughs> you know in Washington State that just has this weird idea about you know black hair or something, right? It's it's unintentional racism, or it's people saying diversity is bad. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Well, that's right. Uh, yeah. That's, that's the most. Or, no, too much is bad. I should say. Too much diversity too much is. is Someone's okay. That's right. That, that's Don't even been, get me started on that one. That that's, one, the <laughs> antithesis of what I do. That's been the recent headline in both our countries, like in Canada and USA. Yeah, yeah that's right. The politicians saying that. Well, like, uh, and Sean Hannity said that. Oh yeah, that's right. Sorry, it was Sean Hannity who said it in the states. Here it was, uh, I think, a Quebec politician, was it not? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <sighs> Maxime Bernier. Was it actually Maxime? Yeah. Yeah. Who is starting a new political party? That's right. The, the, the People's Party of Canada. The People's Party. Yeah. And he's not running a, a, <laughs> yeah, a race to lead, for the leadership. He's no. just declaring as himself. As soon as I hear People's Party, I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> but not too much diversity in that party. Just, yeah. just, no, that's right. So we're going with <laughs> just Chairman a, Maxime? Is that what we're doing? Chairman Maxime. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Is that the uh, White People's Party? Yeah, essentially. Well, again, not too much diversity in the party. You can't have too much. That's that's going to be bad for Canada. <laughs> right. Too oh, much. God. There's, a, there's a limit to the diversity we're allowed to have, what, which essentially means don't have too many brown people. <laughs> that's right. We, 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 need, we, need, we need to, you know, like, you got you to stay the majority white. <laughs> if you have too many brown. <laughs> if it starts to feel like we're getting too few white people, then... 
but he's like, oh, that's not what I meant. He's like, oh, no, actually, I meant that that we need to be more like united as Canadians in our values, and and we can't have too much. You can't have all these other values and blah 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 blah. He blah, blah. also he also tweeted something like super like questionable right on the anniversary of Charlottesville, right? And it was like, oh Jesus, <laughs> and it's, and then you know. People in the media, they kind of drew conclusions and they're like, okay, well, maybe he's on the side of the nationalists who are marching in Charlottesville, as one might if you tweet a racist thing on the anniversary of Charlottesville. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then he was all, oh, no, I didn't mean it that way. I just didn't know that was the day that I was tweeting sure. that racist thing. <laughs> Sounds yeah, yeah, exactly. It was racist anyway, but it happened to be on that day. Like what? No, uh, no, yeah, white fragility. Yeah. But that, that's my biggest thing about. It. I, I can't like. There is definitely right now a, a whole mentality that that white people shouldn't become the minority ever. Like that, it's like that's that would be bad for both of our countries. <laughs> and, and I'm just like, but why? I'm but like, why? Like exactly. what? What is? That's really just your fear. That's just really you're worried that you'll be treated the way you've been treating all of us for for so long. Right. So. Sure seems like it. Well, <laughs> so well, I saw a, a stat or, or a study or something that said within two or three generations, a white American will be a minority. <laughs> Could be. I mean, maybe if you add all the other right. Right. They'll, they'll no longer be together. the majority. Yeah, but, but that's right. just, that's just it. Yeah, there's so many different ethnic groups. Um, yeah, like, 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 how does that work? Like, it's just like everybody who has beyond this skin tone is the majority now, or is it like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, right. I, yeah. Well, cause <laughs> yeah, just people who, who, who check white, not Hispanic on the forms. <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> right. On the census, it's got to be white, non-Hispanic. Non-Hispanic. Yeah. Yeah, we actually have that. That's what it's it's called, white non-Hispanic, because I'm like, okay, what, there's another white that I don't know about. I don't know. I haven't figured it out. I know in our own province here, First Nations people will eventually be the majority. Yeah. Like the way that their population is growing. That's, here in Saskatchewan anyway. Yeah. And that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I see no problem with that. <laughs> in fact, we might be better off. I think in the long run, yeah. It's their it's their land. Colonial so. settlers haven't really done the best job here. No, no. <laughs> but we have to remember our heritage, Corey. <laughs> right, right. Don't don't rename things. Don't take statues down. Sir John A. Macdonald is that's our heritage. Totally our heritage. He's totally cool too. You can't erase history, Corey. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> somehow, somehow the statue is keeping history intact. But you people in residential school should probably get over it. Yeah, that's right. And forget that. Even though that forget was... Forget that even happened. Yeah. Because that's, that was so long ago now. What, 30 years? <laughs> <laughs> you can forget that thing. We're going to honor this thing. Yeah. That's a whole other topic, but that's, <laughs> yeah. that's related to oh, white, white, white fragility stuff. It really is. It really is, yeah. right? Like, Yeah. And that would be like that'd be like telling a Chilean, you know what? We're gonna have a Pinochet statue in the park, right. um, you know, because that's your history, and that's that's just that's. And we're gonna age. honor that history. We're gonna honor that. And, but you got to get over the other stuff that yeah. you did. You're gonna have to walk by every day and remember how he murdered thousands of your people, and imprisoned your father, and <laughs> all these <Yeah>. things, <laughs> because it's a part of your history, right? Yeah. Right, just, just like just like all the the Hitler statues in Germany, they have, <laughs> <laughs> and all the. Although it's, it it does seem like people are forgetting that part of history somehow. <laughs> well, people, people here anyway, people people, yeah. in, people in the states especially. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 They'd like to erect some statues of him somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Except Ugh. they'll put khaki pants on him. Yeah. Yeah. Give him a tiki torch. Tiki torch. Yeah. A yeah. shitty haircut. <laughs> oh, I guess he's... Hitler already had yeah, that. Yeah, he kind of already had, had that. Haircut. That's right. Jeez, eh? Never trust a man that can't grow a full mustache. <laughs> I don't know. I think, he, I think he ruined a good look. He did. <laughs> yeah, Charlie Chaplin had that, right? Charlie yeah. Chaplin pulled it off pretty well. It's and over. Hitler came in and ruined that that quarter mustache. I mean, like geez, it's like it's on. never going to be okay. Like like like, <laughs> no. like 
<laughs> like we're almost a hundred years away from that, and and it's still not okay. I think it's over. That mustache is done. That mustache is just done. It's over. I guess. I guess us white folks can just take that hit there. Trump, Trump is going to ruin the the, the fake tan. That's what he's going to ruin. Uh, he'll, that'll be. I hope so. You can't have a fake tan because Trump had what's, it. What's that? What's that spray on tan <laughs> ever a good look? <laughs> no, no, but. <laughs> <laughs> They'll stop doing it at bodybuilding competitions, though. Yeah. If we can associate it with fascism, that'd be a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the name of the episode is Spray Tans and Fascism. <laughs> Surprisingly connected. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Well, you probably could draw a parallel, really. <laughs> Hitler was going for the Ubermensch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's. Uh, I'm gonna go to some feedback here. Ooh, we post. We had our uh, interview with B.J. Mendelson last time, and uh, it posted earlier this week. And at Jesse Jesse Hoffner on Twitter said, "Great interview. It was cool to hear someone with more familiarity of the influence of social media to kind of tamp down on the Russia conspiracy shit. Great show as always." Oh. Yeah, it was it was interesting like to kind of say like maybe a little bit of like this oh Russia in social media influence might have been a little bit overblown. Uh maybe. I mean, I think there's st- there was there was definitely influence. Right. But it wasn't as, you know, it's not like it's like I'm going to vote for Hillary. Oh, this Russian bot told me she's terrible. I guess it's Trump. No, I don't think that's what happened. No. Right. <laughs> All they really did was like perpetuate the idea that was yeah. already there. Yeah, it the divisions were there. Right. It was just kind of taken advantage of to some degree. Yeah. I I think it might have had some play into the non-voters, not the switch voters. Yeah. Right. If anything, I'd say Comey had more play than the Russians. <laughs> Comey, yeah, that was a bad move. Yeah, that was horrible. And after the same episode, at Jeff Nords on Twitter said, I really enjoyed it and it made me reflect on my social media slash online use. Thank you for interviewing him. So that was cool. On YouTube, Roxanne Hinkle said on the interview with Bob Nygaard, the psychic investigator, uh, she said, this is a great episode. I had the pleasure of being on a panel with Bob. So that's cool. New patrons. I already gave her a shout out uh, when I redid the outro for the last show. But Kayla Jean Horan Dimitrik. I hope I said that right. I probably did. Probably not. I almost never say that anything. That name sounds right. familiar. That's Yeah, you might. She's one of our uh, Saskatoon friends. That's who it is. Okay. Yeah, she's yeah. In, She's our newest patron. Oh, good for her. Good for you. Good for us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks a ton, Kayla. And thanks to all our top patrons. Or thanks to all our patrons, but especially our top patrons. Bassett, Sammy, Destin Doesn't Suck That Much, Daryl Goosen, Aaron Young, William Driver, and Positively Skeptical. Becoming a top patron means you donate at the skeptic level, which is $5 per episode or higher on Patreon at patreon.com slash brainstorm podcast. We have no new reviews. Ah, oh, it's a shame. We only have 10 reviews on Apple Podcasts. 10? That's not, 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 the, not too bad. Start. Uh, it, wow. I mean, we've been going for five years. That's two a year. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Has it been that long? Yeah. Oh, my God. In November, it's five years. I've had just as many studios, too. Yeah, I'm just sure. about. I'm sure. <laughs> right. yeah, just as many locations. Well, I already said, instead of being Roman Empire, we should be, what, the Byzantine Empire Byzant- right now? The, maybe we're the Byzantine. <laughs> yeah. 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 We, might, we might actually be the Holy Roman Empire now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's actually pretty. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and now for the uh, plug your stuff segment. Oh, I'm gonna go with Rob. You got stuff to plug. I do have stuff to plug. I am the uh, director of the Original Model Project, a organization who is bound and determined to change the American motto from "In God We Trust" to "E Pluribus Unum" as our founders intended. Right. Um, hmm. uh, you can find all our stuff at originalmotto.us, and. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just happy in there hitting the the streets with that message. So 
Cool. I will definitely add a link to that in our show notes. Cool. Dave, do you have a thing to plug? You know, there's so much going on in my life. I, I, I'm like... It's hard to pick one thing. I'm grasping to say, think what I should plug. Um, I know there's... I don't know when it's happening, but one of the films I scored is screening in London. Um, That's cool. Next month, I think, or something. <laughs> I'm like loose. I don't know when things are happening because there's too much. I, uh, right. But... Uh, yeah, that's called From Up North. It's a short film about um, residential, a residential school survivor and oh, kind neat. of story. Um, actually, from we up, have From Up North. From Up North. Yeah. Okay. It's actually interesting. Interesting little. It's short, but it's like basically um, there was a whole interview process with the um, residential school survivors, and so people like collected stories basically. Wow. And so this this uh, First Nations uh, friend of mine, she she's a filmmaker as well. And she was like adopted into a white family, so has a very different uh, childhood experience than some of some of her colleagues, right? And, right. And uh, so she was one of these. I think they call them truth keepers, or I don't know. I can't remember what they called them. But anyway, she interviewed elder or people who were in residential school. So we had an elder come in, and uh, Noel Star Blanket is his name, and she interviewed him, and it was really interesting. Yeah. Cool. So, a good two hours of interviewing. But a very short film. <laughs> I will, uh, yeah, I, I will look that up and I will try and find some information to post in the show notes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because like I say, it's screening in London. It's screened lots of places already. Right. But, uh, it probably will continue to screen at various festivals. Very cool. So, Renee, you got anything going on? No, nah, of course not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Brainstorm has a newsletter now. Oh. I, uh. We'll be sending out an, a weekly newsletter. You can sign up by going to our website and clicking on the sign up uh, click thing button. Button. It's called a button. <laughs> up in the right-hand corner of your screen. Or there should be a pop-up that comes up. Uh, if you go to our website, brainstormblog.net, you'll get news, updates, links, and the new show notes and a bunch of other stuff every week. I guess that's it. Let's click that Outro music. For all the other things, you can check out the show notes at thebrainstormpodcast.com and our website, brainstormblog.net. Thanks to our financial supporters, Kayla, Janet, Kim, Stephanie, Zach, the Utah Outcasts, Bassett, Will, Aaron, Daryl, Destin Sucks, Bob Glenn, Dustin Doesn't Suck That Much, <laughs> Magnus, several species of small furry animals gathered together in a cave, Positively Skeptical, Rob, <laughs> Keith, the Podong Polymath, and Larry. If you want to join them and help the show grow, then you can do that at patreon.com slash brainstormpodcast. Or you can go and buy some stuff at tpublic.com slash stores slash brainstorm dash podcast dash gear. You can join us every two weeks on brainstormradio.net. Our next live show is on September 28th, and our guest will be Baba Brinkman, science rapper. Thanks again to Richard for joining us. You can find more of his stuff at... The Earth Facebook.com slash the Earthbound Parent or I think he said Eurasia.com. I don't remember. I'm just gonna Google his name. I'm also going to Google his name and I recommend you do it as well. <laughs> so make sure to check that out. And also remember I'm offering a free copy of his book, The Earthbound Parent, to the first listener to get in touch with me. Thanks, Rob, for joining us. Oh, I, it was a pleasure. <laughs> I will uh definitely post links to the original module product project <laughs> <laughs> that's right i own that website too okay i got uh fox news bungled us one time and i went and bought it perfect <laughs> <laughs> thanks to dave for our intro music thanks to aaron rabbi from Invo embrace the void podcast for doing the voiceover for the intro you can find his stuff at voidpod.com Thanks to Alex Kepper Murdoch for doing the voiceover for our ads, and thanks to Jason Camo for our outro music. You can find his stuff at lostdataMind.com. All music played is either with permission or under the SoCan license to play. For more information on SoCan, you can check out the music license info page on our website, brainstormblog.net. Remember to give us a rating, a thumbs up, or a fave on your podcatcher of choice. Join our Facebook group, like our page, follow us on Twitter, share the show, and spread the word. Seriously, share, like, and comment on facebook or twitter reply retweet and all of that stuff increased engagement means more people see the stuff thanks for listening and remember the truth matters
This is an opinion-based podcast. Each person on the podcast is responsible for their own opinions, and those opinions don't necessarily reflect the views of the rest of the panel. Any guests or anyone associated with the people on the podcast, such as spouses, partners, children, other family members, friends, or employers. No one person speaks for the podcast, with the possible exception of Corey, and he doesn't speak for anyone else on the show. The Brainstorm podcast does not represent the views of our sponsors.